I work at the uh, Coastal Resources Center at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about aquaculture today, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself because, quite frankly, most of my time is not spent in the United States. It's spent uh, abroad uh, working on sustainable development issues in um, places that are a lot less uh, capable, uh, a lot less economically disadvantaged than we are here in the United States. So sometimes when I come back to, every time I come back to the United States, I think about how lucky we are uh, with the place that we live in and how nice our environment and our economy is. But a lot of the places I work in, it's not like that. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the Coastal Resources Center. Um, and we have uh, a number of projects both abroad, all over the world, in Southeast Asia, Latin America, uh, and Africa, but also right here in Rhode Island and southern uh, New England. And generally the projects fall into three type of uh, categories, either looking at sustainable seafo seafood, uh, looking at people and trying to develop resilient communities, empower people to make decisions about how they want their coast to look, um, and also well-planned coasts. And you'll probably hear a little bit about you know, all the wind farming going on offshore. So some of my colleagues do a lot of the work that, uh, in terms of the marine spatial planning, uh, working with the state to figure out where are we going to put the windmills and how are we going to address conflicts with the fishing industry and all the other uses of that uh, marine space. But my work works um, in all of these areas, but again, like I said, outside the United States. And most recently, I've been focusing on sustainable fisheries. So I run a 24 million six year grant from the US Agency for International Development as my major project that I work on right now. And my wife and I, and that's, she circled in the red there with me, lived in Ghana for about two and a half years at the start, start of the project about five years ago. And all the people you see in that picture are people that I work with. And when we talk about trying to develop uh, sustainable fisheries, the fisheries in Ghana are collapsing. Uh, the catches are down to historic lows, only about 10% of what they were 10 years ago. And there are reasons for that. Um, and many, many problems, both created by the government, but also the resource users themselves. So our belief is you really got to get everybody in the room together. And everyone's part of the problem, so everybody has to be part of the solution. So you can see in that picture in the very center there is the Minister for Fisheries. We have the Director of the Fisheries Commission, uh, Dennis Ahato from the university, and then a lot of uh, groups that we work with, women fish processing associations, uh, members of the National uh, Fishermen's uh, Canoe Council, uh, and environmental NGOs, and all working to try to figure out um, how we're gonna solve those problems. Now, Ghana um, has what they call the, an artisanal or small scale sector. And it's kind of an oxymoron because they call it the canoe sector. And the picture on the bottom of the page there, you can see that's what a typical fishing harbor looks like. So when we talk about canoe fishing uh, in Ghana, we don't talk about these little things you get in and paddle around here in the United States. Some of these boats are 60 feet long, have a crew of 20 people on them, and they'll go 100 miles offshore with nothing more than a 40 horsepower upward engine. Um, but they've managed to overfish uh, the stocks um, in the Gulf of Guinea uh, in this area. So uh, we have to figure out how we can get back to a more sustainable approach to those fisheries. Um, these are some of the people I work with. These are my three sisters in Ghana. That they, call, they call themselves uh, Brian's three sisters. And they work with, uh, they're very strong, powerful um, Ghanaian women, and they work with uh, women's based organizations of fish processors and traders. And we work through them and their associations to try to empower many of the women involved in the fishery. About 50% of the employment uh, in the fishery is women. They primarily work in the post harvest sector, processing fish and then trading and selling it um, on the street corners and all over the country and actually all over West Africa. So fish that's harvested along the coast goes very, very far inland, areas that uh, don't even have a coast. Um, again, this is kind of some pictures. This is Elmina Harbor up in the, in the upper left. And again, you can see how big these boats are. Um, and like I said, mainly uh, men go out fishing and women do the processing. And here she is processing a bunch of the sardines and other ones that they smoke and dry and then ship around the country. Um, but I noticed uh, just a little bit earlier, you were reading about oysters and oyster, uh, oyster farming in East Africa. Um, and in, in this case, right outside of Accra, the capital of Ghana, 
Women also do a lot of harvesting of uh, resources, of marine and estuarine resources. And in this case, they're harvesting uh, oysters in an estuary. Uh, so one of the things that we have done is we've worked with the women to uh, empower them, uh, organize them, give them leadership skills, and teach them a little bit about oyster biology and ecology and how they can sustain the oyster harvests that feed their families and, and generate income for them. They used to th think that oysters walked on the seafloor, but actually they don't, and they know that now. Um, but some of the things that have been happening is they've been cutting mangroves, which are essential habitat for this sort of uh, oyster, um, and the o mangroves have almost completely disappeared in this estuary. So one of the things we've been working with them with is talking to them about habitat restoration. You might have talked with this a little bit about with Perry Rosso the other day, uh, putting oyster shells back into the bay so that uh, they uh, are the places where the baby oysters will attach to and grow. So the more oyster shells you put back, the, the bigger the harvest you can get. The more mangroves you plant and, and keep them there and don't cut them down, uh, the oysters grow on the roots of the mangroves. So by uh, rehabilitating some of the essential habitats in the marine environment, we can also um, make that, uh, help that create a sustainable uh, oyster fishery. Another thing we are doing also is a little bit of uh, aquaculture piloting. Uh, uh, in the estuary as well with them and seeing whether we can grow them through uh, you know, oyster farming. But I really believe that um, just, you know, you have a wild harvest of the oysters. So rather than, you know, decimate the wild stocks of fish and then we have to grow them through aquaculture, uh, let's make sure that we're harvesting those wild stocks sustainably. Because um, aquaculture, things like oyster culture, is, can be very, very environmentally friendly or not too destructive, but there's a lot of aquaculture around the world that is not done sustainably and can be very, very much environmentally uh, damaging. And, um, there's a lot of work that's being done to try to make aquaculture more sustainable, but most of the fish stocks uh, overseas are uh, in decline. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm focusing on the fisheries, because sustainability is very important also for wild harvesting of our fish stocks. Um, this is me a long time ago when I was a little bit skinnier. Uh, I graduated from high school and then went to college down in Florida and got a degree in oceanography and I was inspired by that man over there on the right hand side who has a nose kind of like mine called Jacques Cousteau. Uh, and he's why I went into kind of the marine trade because I read his books on uh, diving for sunken treasure and you know life and death on a coral sea and seeing all his videos on TV. Uh, and after I graduated with a degree in oceanography I was either going to go down to Florida and become a marine uh, aquarium uh, collector with my roommate or join the Peace Corps and I decided to join the Peace Corps and I went over to Southeast Asia and lived in Malaysia and the Philippines for about uh, the next six years of my life before I came back to the University of Rhode Island. Um, and I worked as an aquaculture extension agent and that's where I was way up in the highlands of northern Luzon in the Philippines. We were doing some consulting of a hatchery way up there. And one of the benefits of uh, being there to, at the rice harvesting season is you get to, you know, it's a, rice harvesting is a community, uh, a community event. And after you harvest the rice and you help the farmer harvest the rice, then you sit down and you celebrate a little bit drinking rice wine. And you can see from that picture I'm smiling a little bit too much, so I probably harvested one too many uh, rice fields <laughs> on that day. Um, but here in Rhode Island, aquaculture is one of the fastest growing industries. Uh, it's very, very small but it's really growing and I think that that might be a picture of Perry Rosso's farm over on the right hand side where you went there when it was warm but in the winter you have to kind of chip through the ice to find your oysters if you want to get them out and uh, sell them in the winter time. Um, you get to wear cool you know red uh, suits like this, uh, work on boats so uh, if you like being outdoors and on the water um, aquaculture might be a business for you um, it's hard work though, you know, um, so it's not an easy cushy uh, job, but if you like physical work, um, you can do it. And actually when I was in college, one of my jobs uh, after going to school to help pay for my college was I, down in Florida, I used to rake uh, oysters and harvest oysters uh, from the Indian River uh, Lagoon and that helped pay for my college. But I just, this picture on the left, this is a lady out in Block Island. So seaweed farming is also the other big thing that's happening now in Rhode Island, the sugar kelp is a, emerging aquaculture, but I just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, uh, aquaculture isn't just for men, but also women. There's a lot of women who are involved in the industry. So both boys and girls, we can all, we can all do this sort of uh, work. Uh, and you probably heard from Perry that, you know, that this is very important from a job standpoint. 
uh, sustainability systems and that you know aquaculture is relatively environmentally friendly. It t sucks out nutrients from the water, so it helps clean our water um, and make it uh, you know clearer, and that's healthy for the the ecosystems in our bays and our, our salt ponds along the, the, the South Shore. And if you wanted to do a job in aquaculture, there's a lot of opportunities for you. One way is if you want to get a degree, both Roger Williams University and the uh, University of Rhode Island have undergraduate and graduate degrees that will train you on uh, fisheries and aquaculture technology. Um, but I'd also like to point out in the upper left, this education exchange program, and it's probably hard to read, but you see this, it says aquaculture job training. And this is based in Peacedale, Rhode Island, which is where I live, on the other side of the bay. And um, my uh, colleagues at CRC are involved with them. And this is an opportunity that I heard somebody was interested in aquaculture. Raise your hand if you're interested. Uh, you can get paid. It's a paid training program. So while you learn how to become an aquaculture farmer, you get paid for doing it. So that's a pretty good deal, uh, in my opinion. And that might be something you might want to think about. Uh, and you can just kind of Google them and, uh, and get trained. Uh, the state's paying for people to get trained. I just wanted to say a few things about sustainability, and I think you've probably seen this graph in some of your handouts where we have the, you know, the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations that fit in these nice little colored and fancy boxes with a nice little uh, icon on it. Um, most of the places I work in are the areas where the sustainable development goals are barely met. And that's why I've been focusing my career, my life work, over the last 30 years uh, working in these developing countries. Um, but I would like to make the point that, you know, well, you have these nice, neat boxes. Everything is very much interconnected. And if you look at the box on the far right, that basically is how we uh, look at the systems, the fishery system in Ghana, and what we have to do to try to fix it. So everything is interconnected. Um, everything needs to be integrated that we do if we really want to get to sustainability. I've been trying to reach sustainability for 30 years and there are, quite frankly, aren't many places where I've seen it actually functioning yet. But we're definitely on the journey to get there, I hope, before we destroy our planet. And that's what worries me the most. If you look at some of the things that are happening, for instance, with climate change, I worry about, I'm a grandfather now, and I worry about what the future is going to be like for my uh, children. So I would urge you, particularly next year, get out and vote um, because there's a lot of decisions being made that are going to affect your life. Thank you.